The funny part is I actually did write this message three separate times. So there's going to be pieces of all three messages in here and you don't even realize it, but I'm okay with that. So we're going to continue on in our series called Money Monsters. And I am the one with the crazy angry face and the spiky hair. I'm not saying that Eric chose that one for me on purpose. It's just who I am. Especially if you see me in the morning without coffee. Though my legs aren't that high normally. Some of you guys to catch this. I'm just I'm spitballing today right now, so so here we go. Because I've I have three months of, of pent up standing in front of you guys and preaching that I have to get out. So today we're talking about consumerism, money monster. Our money monster today is consumerism. And I was looking up and I kind of found a definition I liked. Um, so I'm going to read it for you. Consumerism can be defined this way. As the magnitude attributed to attaining and owning material products in order to reach important life goals and desired states. In other words, you get stuff so that you can reach life goals and desired states. So if that's the definition of consumerism that I found online source, economics. So why is consumerism a monster? I'm glad you asked. We'll get there in a moment. So we're going to start in a, the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 9 reads like this. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, and my heart found pleasure in all my toil. This was my reward for all my toil. So the writer of Ecclesiastes is often attributed to King Solomon. King Solomon doesn't actually name himself as the author of the book of Ecclesiastes, but when you look at all the things that is mentioned in there, it kind of is, it points more to him than any other king in Israel. So it is often attributed to him. So when he says, when he says something like, I kept my heart from no pleasure, it holds a little bit more significance because as the king of Israel, he was the richest of all the kings. So when he said, I held nothing back, it's a little bit different than you or I saying, well, I gave myself everything I wanted. When he says that, the magnitude is far greater than what are you or I could purchase. So I just want you to think about that for a second. He kept his heart from no pleasure. No pleasure. Ecclesiastes is Solomon looking for meaning in his life. He looks, at, he looks at several things. He looks at folly, which really includes being drunk all the time. And if you, if you think I'm kidding, just read the book of Ecclesiastes. It talks about knowledge and how he was the wisest man in all the world and how he refers to that continuously. He's trying to find meaning in these things. But then he takes a moment where he's trying to find meaning and accomplishment. And that's really what he's referencing here in verse 9 when he says that the reward of all my toil... So Solomon's idea of fulfillment is the part of this definition, owning products and material to reach important life goals and desired states. He was trying to find meaning in what he's able to do. And as I was thinking about this, this passage and the, this verse specifically, I started thinking about the movie Castaway, where Tom Hanks is jumping around on the beach after he finally gets fired. He's like, I have made fire. And like he's running around, he's singing. Um, Song about um, oh crap! What's the song? It's um by I can't think of the guy's name. He he's one of the guys who died at 27 years old. Doors from the Doors. Um, some of you guys will catch on. Some guys like Craig, you're really off today, but it's okay. Um, but it's this idea that he is excited about what he was able to do with his hands. Think of it this way: uh, for for more of a at home thing, it's like when you succeed in building something from IKEA without getting in a fight or breaking something else? What do you do? You stand on your porch and you're like, I have done this. I have conquered the Swedish engineers. It's a moment where you're excited. So you celebrate it. So here, Solomon's doing that. He's taking a moment where he's like, I have done all this with my hands. And as we'll dig deeper into this, you'll see the problem there. He keeps saying, I've done this with my hands. So what are some of the things that he was able to get from all this toil? Well, if you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, this is what he's talking about. I made great works. I built houses. Notice it says houses. I planted vineyards. 
for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted them in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any other who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and treasure of kings and, and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of, so, the, delight of the sons of man. All right, so he really went at it. Like, there's a TV show that, that I, I hate watch. Um, it's with, with Amy. It, it's called um, My Million Dollar Mansion, or it, the guy, people, Million Dollar Dream Home. They go out and they won, they won the lottery, and so they suddenly feel they have to, their, their tiny house is no longer acceptable. So they need to spend their whole entire lottery winnings on a house that they don't need. You're one person. You don't need 15 rooms in five bathrooms. You can only use one bathroom at a time. You know, it's this thing that all this stuff, and I'll be honest, I didn't give you the complete definition on consumerism. The rest of the definition reads like this. Materialism leads cons to consumerism, and that is the pursuit of happiness by primarily buying and consuming tradable goods and services. The pursuit of happiness by goods. You see, he gave himself everything, and this is where consumerism can become a monster. This is where this, this thing becomes so much greater than just buying stuff that we need. Because he was trying to define himself by everything he was able to give himself. And he was able to give himself quite a lot. He was able to give himself anything that his eye set upon. Like, when, if you've ever shopped for a car, what do you do? You research, you know, 15, 20 cars. You find that car that you really want, and you end up buying the car that you really can afford. Well, normally, there's some of us that buy the car that we really want. But you see, this monster is trying to find happiness based on stuff, based on what you can do, based on what your hand can provide for yourself. And as I was thinking about this idea of, of mon money monsters, I kept coming back to the seven deadly sins. And as I actually was just reading or watching something on the seven deadly sins, and I think that's why it was partially in my mind. But really there's, there's one that I, I kind of felt was really good coming back to this, and it's gluttony. And oftentimes when we think about gluttony, we think about food. And, and historically that is the primary definition of it, but there is also another definition of gluttony. It is this, but gluttony is the overindulgence and the overconsumption of anything to the point of waste. The word derives from the Latin meaning to gulp down or to swallow. Gluttony can be interpreted as selfishness, essentially placing concern with one's own impulses or interest above the well-being well or interest of others. Gluttony comes from the word to gulp down. Have you ever been so thirsty that like you're drinking something and you like barely even hits like any part of your mouth that's going straight down? Or have you ever eaten something and you choked on it because why? You didn't chew on it, you just kind of were swallowing it. Whatever I think about, whenever I think about gluttony, um, and it's funny because Amy and I were just talking about, I think about Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving. I've expressed to you before how incredible Thanksgiving is for me and all the stuffing that my mom makes and the, the pounds of turkey and the corn and the mashed potatoes and the sweet potatoes and the, the mixed vegetables and the sweet rolls and the desserts and that's just my family. And I know some of you guys have bigger smorgasbords than I do. And what do we do at Thanksgiving? We sit down and we do what? We fill one plate. We finish that plate. And then we're like, you know what? This is Thanksgiving. Go up for plate number two. And you're like, oh, man, this is Thanksgiving. Go up for plate number three. And we're like, I shouldn't be doing this. And then you're still doing it. And at the end of the meal, what do you do? You sit back. You're like, oh, I need some Tums. You fall into that food coma, coma and you sit back and you, you, you pop the, the top button on your pants. You're like, Ugh. 
That or you're prepared for this and you're wearing your stretchy pants. But And then what happens? An hour later, you're eating a pumpkin log and pumpkin pie. As much as I enjoy that and I'm smiling and I'm salivating at the same time, gluttony. Perfect example of that. Did you need the second plate? No. Did you need the third plate? No. Did you need to just lather everything together in one giant slurry of food and swallow it? No. But you did. So when you're thinking about this idea of gluttony, when you're thinking about this idea of, of consumerism, really that's what's going on. Do you need all the things that you're chasing because is it truly going to make you happy? As happy as all that food made you while you were eating it, now you need a Tums and later you're going to have to, well, yes, you're going to have to experience the food in another way. Food goes in, food comes out, people. That's biology. But here's the thing. You ate and you ate and you ate and you ate to the point where you made yourself uncomfortable. That's really what consumerism is all about. You take and you take and you take because you think you're getting happy. You think that it's, it's paying off. You think that this is going to be satisfying. But in the end, the, satisfying, the satisfaction is only so, oh, oh so fleeting. And what am I getting at here? Let's talk about this a little bit more. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11. This is how Solomon finishes this idea. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. Solomon had examined his life and saw that it was meaningless. He had not held anything back, and in the end, he's like, it's vanity and a chasing after the wind. Another, uh, another way that it, this is expressed is it's a grasping after the wind. It's kind of like, um, have you ever seen, like, water's coming out, and you see, like, cats or dogs, like, they're, they're pawing, pawing through it. They're trying to get a drink, but you're like, are they trying to grab that? You can't. You can't grab the wind. You're chasing the wind. You can't get a hold of it. You can chase it for as long as you want. You will never catch the wind. It's, it's so, it's fleeting. It's not going to be there. Solomon never said no to himself. He was seeking to find satisfaction. And if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, which I encourage you to do that, you have to see that this man literally held nothing back in his search to find meaning. He did everything he could to try and find a way that this life would make sense. And like I said, Solomon, richest man in the world. Mark chapter 8, verse 36, reads like this. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? To steal a line from a movie, the things you own end up owning you. Too often times, we put so much focus in on stuff that we lose really the eternal aspect of this. Whatever you have on earth is temporary. And I think sometimes we lose that. I think sometimes we are so focused on keeping up with the Joneses that we're really not paying attention to what God has in store. Now, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into that in a second, but this idea of this is temporary, we've all heard the cliches. There's no uh, U-Hauls attached to hearses and, you know, he who dies with the most toys still dies. We've heard all those cliches. And it's true. But how do we deal with this? If you work hard at, at getting, getting what you want, you might eventually have a pleasurable life but in the end, you'll find that it's hollow and it's empty. Think about it this way. So you've upgraded your phone, and then two months later, you find out that the next version is coming out of your phone. And now if you look at your phone, you're like, this is just a paperweight. And that's a kind of an extreme, but I think that happens with some of us. I think sometimes we're, we're so focused on how this made me feel. I was excited. I got to, you know take a selfie with my phone and be like, this is my new phone. Or how about this? We chase after a job to get an extra 30 cents an hour. Or we work 
five, six hours of overtime every couple days just so we can make more money. But what are you really gaining? Yes, that paycheck's going to be nice. But what is the sacrifice that you're making to get that extra pay? Really, it comes down to this. It comes to balance. And this is the rub. There has to be a balancing act, and this is where the spiritual comes into play. In 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 11, it reads like this. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we, bought no, we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through the, the craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many prayings. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. You see, it's easy to ignore consumerism. And as I dig deeper into this, there's going to be a part of you that wants to push back on this because, well, we need stuff. This life, things are not given to us. And so it's very easy to let consumerism start out as something that, well, I have to work a job because I have to provide for a home or I have to get food. But if, we're, if we slowly let consumerism take us over, it will, it will take and run amok in our lives. You see, if we're going to fight and we're going to kill this, mon this monster, the way to kill the money monster of consumerism is you must find contentment. And as we look at this idea of consumerism, I'm going to just take a moment and talk about the practical as well as the spiritual. But let's take a, let's take a moment and talk the practical end here. When consumerism... You will not find contentment when your spending is out of control. I'm going to take a couple pages from, from Uncle Dave here and talk about this for a second. When your focus is on your paycheck more than on, on God, then you struggle with contentment and you struggle with consumerism. You see, this is where the love of money comes in. And Pastor Fran did a message on this earlier this summer when he talked about the love of money and misused verses. So I encourage you to look that up. And when we talk about the love of money, I think some of you guys have an image of Scrooge McDuck where he used to dive into his money bin and swim around in the gold, which, by the way, that's impossible. I just want you to know that. It's really hard. You'll hurt yourself if you attempt that. And if you have a giant vault full of gold that you can try and swim in, talk to me later. I can find good uses for your money. We have a roof that needs fixed. But that's just a side note. But it's this idea that the love of money if that's your focus, if that's really what you're chasing, if your spending is so far out of control, it's very hard for us to do things that God has called us to do. If your thoughts are on your money all the time, you may have a love-hate relationship. I hate that I have to worry about money. But your focus is on it to the point where it is a problem. You see, this idea of consumerism it is so easy because we need the money, we need the jobs, we need food, we need shelter, we need all these things. But you don't need five credit cards. You know, five credit cards doesn't happen by accident. I know they send you a dozen applications a day for, especially if you're going to school, as soon as you take out that first student loan, they want to give you as many credit cards as you can. And those applications don't get filled out magically. That car loan that you took out after you rolled another car loan in, well, the car company didn't do that to you. Yeah, your car may have been dying, but did you have to roll and buy something that was four times the value? And I know this is hard, and I know some of you are, are going to push back on this idea, but do you really need to buy those new shoes to add to the collection of the other 30 pairs of shoes that you have? We need to take ownership of our choices. And as Uncle Dave would, would teach us, you need to get on a budget. Because that really, when you're going to fight consumerism, when you're going to really fight this desire to have more stuff, you got to get the spending under control. But back to the passage. 
in Timothy, he talks about being contentment. And the word contentment used is autokarhia. And I mispronounced that, but I'm going to act like I didn't. But it means to be completely self-sufficient. That meant a frame of mind in which, which was completely independent of all outward things. In Christ is godliness. You find contentment. Contentment never comes from the possession of external things. I found these questions when it comes to contentment, and I'm going to read them to you. How much, how much of a place does shopping and buying have in your life? How much does material loss affect your happiness? How happy do you get from having material things? Whenever you think about getting something material or getting more of it, will that answer your life's need? Whenever we are deeply grieved by material loss, we lack contentment. Contentment is it's a very fine balance. This idea between consumerism and contentment, it's a fine line that we have to walk. And it's something that you have to find. I cannot give you a simple, a new iPhone is, is not contentment. Replacing your car is not contentment. I can't give you that straight up and down answer. What I can tell you is, where does that align with where you are in your relationship with God? You see, because that's really what it comes down to, because if you're trying to find significance, if you're trying to find meaning in what you have, you're not going to find it. That pair of shoes, as gorgeous as they may be, as high as they may make you jump, which they're not, by the way, but that's not going to make you feel any better because eventually your shoes are going to get dirty because shoes touch the ground and the ground is dirty. That new car, it's going to lose about 30% of its value the moment it drives, drives out of the lot. And someone, you know it. As soon as you go to Giant Eagle, you know that kid is going to kick open the door and it's going to ding the side and you're going to be like, ah! If you are so focused on the material that you can't see anything else, then your passion is for that and your passion is not for Christ. Because what did, what did Paul tell Timothy? He says right here, he said, he said in verse 11, Paul addresses Timothy and he says, but you, O man of God. I don't think Paul wrote those words on accident. I think Paul was trying to grab Timothy's attention. Timothy was a young pastor that Paul had sent to be the pastor of this church. And he said, but you, O man of God. He was trying to call him out. And I think that happens, that needs to happen to us. If you call yourself a Christian, but you, O child of God. But you, you need to find contentment outside of this. You cannot focus so on this. He says, but you, O man of God, flee from these things. Paul reminds him what he's to pursue. He's pr to instead pursue righteousness. He's to pursue godliness. He's to pursue faith. He's to pursue love. He's to per per pursue steadfastness. Some people will translate in that, that into patience and faithfulness. He'll per he's to pursue gentleness. You see, when we're so focused on ourselves, and really consumerism is a monster of selfishness. Deep down inside, that's really what drives consumerism is me earlier solomon said i didn't keep anything from my hands anything my eyes that's what consumerism is all about it's a giant monster of me and that's really what paul's trying to remind this young pastor timothy about he's like hey man you're supposed to pursue righteousness godliness faith love steadfastness gentleness and some of you might be like, okay, those are great words, but how do I pursue something like that? I'm glad you asked. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. 
Read the Gospels. See how Jesus, Jesus interacts with all the people in the Gospels. Really sit down, and I challenge you, for as we go, we're, we're starting October, we're not starting, we're the third week of October, we're heading into November, and then we're going to be hitting Christmas before you even realize that. And if you go to the store, we've already hit Christmas. But here's the deal, as we look at Christmas, and we think about what Christmas represents, the gift of Jesus Christ, think about this. If we're to pursue these things, and if we're going to talk consumerism, Christmas is the biggest thing that, that lights that consumerism up in our lives. I mean, I remember getting the KB toy catalog and circling things, and my parents being like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Did I get everything I wanted on there? <laughs> no. But did I sit there for like hours and be like, oh, if I got this, this would be awesome. And now I do that whenever I walk into Home Depot. Oh, if I had this. Bigger toys, bigger person. But really, this idea of consumerism, this want, this desire, because if I had this, it'll make me happy. No. What did Jesus Christ taught us? He taught us about righteousness. He taught us how to live right with one another. He taught us about godliness. How many times in Scripture does it talk about how Jesus Christ went away to what? Talk to God in prayer. When we talk about this idea when of faith, again, Jesus, whenever he performed the miracles, what did he do? He always involved God in it. Love. One of Jesus, I mean, greater love that have no man than this than to lay his life down for his friends. Jesus died on the cross. If you want to talk about love and sacrificial love, Patience. I mean, if you read this, if you read the Gospels and you see how, see the guys that Jesus chose. You're first off, you're like, Jesus, really? I mean, it gives us hope because if He chose those guys, but He had patience with them. He He did a couple times be like, how dense can you guys be? But again, if you don't believe me, read the Gospels. Gentleness. Let the children come unto me. If you want to see how to do these things, spend time with God. Spend time in the Gospels. Spend time reading and knowing who Jesus Christ is. Because it's not enough for Pastor Eric, for myself, for Pastor Fran, for Pastor Tim, for us to tell you, until you put feet to it, it doesn't matter. I can stand here and talk and give you all 15 messages that I wrote this week, but in the end, you're just going to sit there and sleep. I'll still keep talking, but you're not going to do anything with it. But you have to. If you truly call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to walk this out. And that's how you, that's really what we're coming down to in this. So you need to kill this money monster with contentment. And it always comes down to a heart issue. It's always a heart issue. So where are you at with your relationship with Jesus Christ? I know sometimes that sounds very cliche coming from a pastor. So how are you with Jesus? But really, if we're going to fight money monsters, that's the question you have to answer. Because if you're truly a follower of Jesus Christ, selfishness gets really hard. Because you realize that being selfish is not something that Jesus exemplified. He was completely selfless. Everyone bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to go into a time of communion. And I want to encourage you today that if you, if you take communion, and to take communion here at Elman Church, you just need to be a believer in Jesus Christ. You don't got to be a member here. And if you're not sure what you believe or where you're at with Jesus Christ, you can let communion pass you by. But I want to encourage you today that as we take communion, as you, as you look at the, the cracker and as you look at the juice, I want you to think about what that represents. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins so that we can have eternal life with him. And this, 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 the cracker represents his broken body for us. The blood is the promise of the new covenant. And so I want to encourage you today that as you think about this message, before you take communion, think about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you someone that, that is actively pursuing things like righteousness and godliness and faith and love and gentleness? Are you someone that's pursuing the things of this world? Pursuing how you can be feel satisfaction because you got new stuff today. 
because that that box from Amazon showed up on the porch and now you're happy? Or do you get happy from spending time with God and sharing love with others by serving our community? By serving someone that might not be nice? By serving someone that you, for many instances, don't like, but because of Jesus, you're willing to help. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I pray as we do celebrate communion that that you just help us to be excited about the opportunity we have to to really just commune and, and thank you for the sacrifice. And Father, I pray today that as we look at this money monster consumerism, I pray that you will open our eyes to if we're trying to really define our lives and find meaning in stuff. And if we are, help us to find true contentment with you. Help us to find that balance between stuff and selflessness. We thank you in your holy and precious name. Amen and amen.